So I posted this video on YouTube of Gail Trotter testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on gun violence. It's very interesting. You'll see it on uh, my YouTube channel, Politic. Go check it out. There's also a lot of other videos there right now about the gun control debates. Anyway, I got this uh, comment back by NYC1164, and he says, you didn't play the part where Senator Whitehouse asked her several questions and she could not give a straight answer. Basically, she made a fool of herself. So I uh, went back to my recordings and I found that part of the, of the uh, hearing and I'm making this video. So give it a look. You be the judge. Who made a fool of who? Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've heard testimony in this hearing that the uh, federal gun crime prosecutions number 62 uh, per year and that, quote, we don't prosecute any. And I was surprised to hear that testimony because I was a United States attorney. And in the time that I was a United States attorney, it became an absolute priority of the Department of Justice to prosecute firearms. So I went to every police department in my state to talk up what we could do with, fire, with gun criminals. We set up a special procedure where the Attorney General's office, which has criminal jurisdiction in Rhode Island, and our office viewed gun crimes together to make sure that they were sent to the place where they'd get the most effective treatment. And um, I believe that that continues, although I'm no longer a U.S. attorney. So I pulled up some quick statistics. And according to the Executive Office of United States Attorneys, in 2012, more than 11,700 defendants were charged with federal gun crimes, which is a lot more than not doing it and a lot more than 62, and the numbers are up at the Department of Justice since 2000 and 2001 by more than 3,000 prosecutions. So we may have a debate about whether more should be done um, and who at the witness table actually wants more to be done in the way of gun prosecutions, but I think to pretend that the number is in double digits or that the number is zero is flagrantly wrong and I think inconsistent with the type of testimony that senators should rely on in a uh, situation like this. Um, I'd also add that there's been repeated testimony also mentioned by uh, Senator Durbin that criminals won't subject themselves to a background check and my response to that is that's exactly the point. Criminals won't subject themselves to a background check, so they don't go into the gun shops, and if they do, they get prevented from buying a gun. So instead, they go to illegal means. They go primarily to the main way we distribute guns without a gun check, which a background check, which is to the gun shows. And so um, I think to the extent we can expand the background check, the very fact that criminals won't subject themselves to a background check provides the kind of prevention that Senator Graham was talking about, to keep the guns out of the hands of criminals in the very first case. Um, Chief Johnson, tell me a little bit about the men and women with whom you serve in law enforcement and the type of training and screening that is important both in gun use, in gun safety, in situational awareness, um, before they are put in a position where they are expected to defend the public with firearms. Is that something you just give somebody a gun and say, get in there and go defend the the community, or how, how rigorous and how uh, cautious are you about the training required? The, the process starts well before we even offer you a, a badge, and it is a very robust, uh, in-depth psychological review of whether or not 
we're even going to allow you to enter the force itself. All departments are universal on this issue. It includes psychological, polygraph, and other means to determine whether or not you have the fiber to have that awesome responsibility to carry a gun. The training is exhaustive. Weeks and weeks of training on how to use the weapon and tactically how to deal with it, how to care for it, and how to safeguard that weapon. But it doesn't stop there. Once you're out in the field, a very robust psychological services section, yearly training, and other safety equipment that must be carried. Just talk about teachers having guns. That was guns. exactly where I was going to go. But before we get to teachers, to your knowledge, does the military have the similar types of concerns and programs with respect to uh, arming men and women who serve in our armed forces? It is my understanding, talking with my associates in the military, that public uh, policing mirrors much of what the military does. So against that background, tell me how much sense you think it makes to have our line of defense be armed teachers. Certainly, when we have this discussion, you have to, you know, does, does a teacher have the, 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 the inner fiber to carry that weapon, the awesome responsibility? You're a teacher in a classroom, you're an educator, you've dedicated your entire life to that pursuit, but you've got a sidearm strapped to yourself, and you better have it all the time, because if you put it in your desk drawer, your purse, or your uh, briefcase, and where are you going to leave it? Let me tell you something, carrying this weapon on my side has been a pain all these years. I'm glad I have it if I need it, but I'm going to tell you, it's an awesome responsibility. And what do you do in the summertime when you dress down? How are you going to safeguard that weapon from a classroom full of 16-year-old boys that want to touch it? How are you going to do that? And certainly, the holsters. I'm spending $200 a piece just for the holster, so you can't rip it from my side. So these are all the factors in a robust psychological service section. We all face catastrophic changes in our lives as we go through. Uh, divorce and other things that bring us down. But you, you need people to step in, like we have in policing, to notice those things and deal with them. This is a major issue. We've had cases, including a case in Rhode Island, in which trained police officers who were off duty responded to a situation. And because they hadn't been adequately trained in how to respond off duty, and because they were out of uniform, it led to tragic blue-on-blue -blue events. Presumably that would have some bearing on armed police officers responding to an event in which a lot of armed and untrained teachers are trying to defend students in a school. Yeah, it's the, well, it's a very important point. Uh, two years ago in Baltimore City, an on-duty officer in plain clothes was shot by uniformed on-duty personnel, and they worked the same shift. It's just in the darkness of the night they couldn't tell and as Captain Kelly has, has pointed out, that, that's a major issue in, in the Tucson shooting. And Ms. Trotter, quick question. Sarah McKinley, in defending her home, used a Remington 870 Express 12-gauge shotgun that would not be banned under the statute, correct? Under the I don't, proposed statute. I don't remember what type of weapon she used. Well, trust me, that's what it was, and it would not be banned under the statute. So it doesn't... I think it proves the point that with ordinary firearms, not 100 magazine peculiar uh, types of artifacts. Um, people are quite capable of defending themselves. In fact, that was your example. I respectfully disagree. I understand that you are also a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law, and you were close to Monticello, where Thomas Jefferson penned our Declaration of Independence, and close to Montpelier, where James Madison was instrumental in drafting the Bill of Rights. And I think you can understand that as a woman, I think it's very important not to place undue burdens on our Second Amendment right to choose to defend ourselves. Oh, I, have I no, don't know what I, have I don't no know what weapon she used. Point. My but point is that the example you used is one that would not bear an argument against the proposal that is before us, because that Remington 870 Express is a weapon that would be perfectly allowed. So would it have been unreasonable for her to use a different gun to protect her child? I think that if she was using a 100 weapon, let me put it another way, she would clearly have an adequate ability to protect her family How can without you say the that? need for a 100 round 
piece. How can you say weaponry. that? You you are a large man, and you are not a teenage, a tall, tall man. You are not a young mother who has a young child with her. And I am passionate about this this position because you cannot understand. You are not a woman stuck in her house, having to defend her children, not able to leave her child, not able to go seek safety, on the phone with 911, and she cannot get the police there fast enough to protect her child. And, and she's not simply, used to being in a firefight. Uh, and my point simply is that she did it adequately and successfully with lawful firearms and without the kind of firepower that was brought to bear so that the 12th, 13th, 14th shots could be fired by the man shot okay I'm, but gonna, I'm gonna have to fired. and I'll let you go back to another uh, another round um, well, I'm gonna... this has been a sunfish production <laughs>